Oh, podcast land. We meet again. This time it's episode 135 of this thing we call the podcast. What's going on? I don't know. I'm I'm in an odd mood today, I guess. I don't know. How are you, how are you doing? That's what I really want to know. You uh, sitting in traffic right now listening to this? Are you hanging out at work? Maybe you're unemployed, just chilling at home, sending a couple of uh, job resumes. Who knows? I don't know what you're doing. Maybe let, let us know. Go on our Facebook. Just randomly comment what you're doing right now. And it's going to look odd to everyone reading it, except for me. And then I will comment back what I'm doing. Even though none of you motherfuckers will do this, but if you do, that would be awesome. But anyways, this episode of the podcast is brought to you by our boys in Silence in Solitude. Based out of southern New Jersey, Silence in Solitude is a metalcore quintet that consists of Shane Roxas, Colby Hampel, Cody Mitchell, Alexander Coates, and Justin Pomper. The band formed in early 2015 and made their debut in September of the following year, 2016, having spent the previous year writing and recording. Well, what did they put out? Meh, well, just a little thing called Resurgence, their debut album, which came out in December of 2016, and it debuted at number 20 on the iTunes metal charts. They have released music videos for their single Suffering, Deceiver, and for the cover of Mariah Carey's All I Want For Christmas Is You. They did that too. Way better than I just did it. But if you don't want to take my word for how awesome these guys are, if you don't want to take their word for how awesome they, they are, what about New Transcendence? They said that Resurgence is a must-listen for 2016, without a doubt, especially for fans of metal and its subgenres. If you're looking for something that is emotionally powerful, but not too whiny, aggressive, but not hate-filled, and will stand the test of time, this is the album you've been searching for. For more information, hit up www.silenceinsolitude.com. This episode is also brought to you by our boys, our other boys, our West Coast boys, in 627. So, they said, imagine the Foo Fighters and Muse stuffed in an underground studio during the nuclear holocaust with nothing but Weezer and Radiohead album succession, blah 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 blah. Well, you don't need to imagine that shit anymore. Just listen to 627. They sound exactly like what they just told me to write. Or what they told me to read. Read, write, arithmetic. I don't give a shit. Anyways, delivering the attitude of an underdog and the punch of a champion, 627's chunky guitar riffs, charismatic vocals, and emotional solos are the most beautiful ass whooping your ears will have ever taken. Will ever taken? Will have, yeah, will ever taken. Well, we'll go with that. Why not, right? Anyways, for more information, you can hit up dub7records.com. That's dub7records.com. And you can also hit them up on Facebook, facebook.com slash S-I-X-T-W-O-S-E-V-E-N, and then the number 627. So 627 written out, 627 numbers. Or just hit the hit the link below on the description. Easy enough, huh? So last but not least, the Behind the Barricade podcast or network or where the fuck we are. Whatever Behind the Barricade is this day. We are sponsoring Nowhere Fest, happening from October 20th to the 22nd, up at the Chance Complex in beautiful Poughkeepsie, New York. And it's beautiful only in that one rock, one block radius. You step outside that block, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> I'm dead serious. I wish I was joking around. But on Friday, October 20th, you have killer bands such as Body Snatcher, Cock Punch, Conveyor, Backswing, Contradictions... Uh, October 21st, you have Comeback Kid, you have Burn, Cold as Life, Jesus Peace, Full Blown Chaos, Locked Away, Shots Fired. On on Sunday, October 22nd, you have Unbroken Wings, Slapshot, Recon, Buried Dreams, Degrader, Hangman, Misgiver, and so much more. Tickets are on sale now for $25 in advance, $30 for a day of show, and a three-day pass is 60 bucks. So essentially, you're paying for Saturday and Sunday, and you're getting Friday free. Can't beat that, huh? So it's going to be a whole bunch of great hardcore and, and uh, metal bands. You also have a bunch of tattoo artists going to be there. So this is an event you do not want to miss. Yeah, that, that's all I have to say about that. So anyways, let's get into, get onto the episode. We have myself and Dan talking about basically everything but music. I don't know how that all worked out or why we even did this. We, we, there's barely any music news, to be honest with you. So, decided to talk about some random things. 
And then we end everything with um, we end everything with Kevin and his uh, interview with Save Us from the Archon, Archon, whatever it is, A R C H O N. So save us from that. There we go. Episode one thirty five starts right now. From out of the wasteland of generic podcasts and radio shows, one has emerged. It prides itself on having conversations with the most talented musicians from all over the world. If you like a boring question and answer interview, this isn't for you. If you want deep conversations about anything and everything, you've come to the right place. Your new favorite show starts now, and its name is Behind the Barricade. All right, we are not live. <laughs> nope. We are recorded, and you are listening to this sometime on Monday morning. Or not really Monday, Thursday. I, I, dude, I have no idea what day of the week it is. <laughs> I don't know. I, I always know. Since I've been at my, my job for years, I'm always like, it's Monday. All right, it's Tuesday. It's Wednesday, Thursday. All right, tomorrow's tomorrow's Friday. I'm well, like, well, you, can, you have days. to, though. Yeah. Like, people are being asked you, oh, so what's the date today? I'm sure you get that more than any other person. Yeah, but I, it's more for, like, people that don't have anything to do. Like, I you always have, have something scheduled, so I'm like, all right, Thursday I have this. Friday I have this. Saturday I have gotcha. this. Sunday, you know? <laughs> okay. I, I, thought, I thought you said that uh, people have nothing to do, so they ask you for the date. I was about to say, that's fucking... That, that's when you know you have a lot of free time. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I mean, like... They don't have anything scheduled, so they, there's no need to pay attention to the day. That's true. Eh. Mm -hmm. Like me, dude, I count down. If it's not if it's not Saturday, I'm always like, <laughs> what day is today? I wake up knowing exactly what day it is. Jeez. I know. Tell me about it. That's how much I do not want to work. Wouldn't that be the complete opposite, though? Wouldn't you not know the day of the week if you didn't want to work that much well i think it for me it's i'm always looking forward to saturday so yeah. i know like i hone in like i'm going i'm going to work on monday just for saturday <laughs> ah, damn i know tell me about it but then I, again i i've been working seven days a week now for i don't even know how fucking long anymore well i mean i so started like, out working six days a week for yeah. most of my time I've only been in a job that's nine to five Monday through Friday for like two years, three years. Uh huh. Heard that. I know. Me too. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm. I'm trying to think. Uh, when was the first time I started a, a regular nine to five? I think it was right out of college. I I used to work for a uh, my county's planning uh, department, mm -hmm. and over there it was you know nine to five Monday through Friday. It was it was a pretty good gig. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I always worked a nine to fiver. It just wasn't the typical Monday through Friday. Yeah, yeah, it, was yeah, like, it was like having off Wednesday and working kind of half days on Saturday and Sunday. Ooh, I know. Tell me about it. And I would always get asked to work on Wednesday, my only <laughs> day off. And knowing me, yeah, me the person Dan. that can't say no. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to ask you to come in. Oh, yeah. God, office space. <laughs> of course, man. Why not? You could say no, but do you really want to say no to your boss? That's basically the tone. Yeah, no. Yeah, what's happening, Dan? It's like <laughs> you're going to avoid him at all costs. He's not in today. And boom, he shows up right at the time you're leaving to ask you if you want to work. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he doesn't ask you. He tells you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to need you to come in on Saturday. Yeah, thanks. But I'm um, pretty sure that's my day off, and I'm don't have to come in so yeah no yeah we need you to, we need you to come in and possibly sunday too <laughs> oh, dude that is such a funny movie that i haven't seen enough i've only seen it like twice really i th well i would say like three times but really not more than that it's like one of those movies for me where if it comes on i have to watch it like same but, thing with like goodfellas i've only seen that movie once oh my god what, my what friend showed it to me oh, uh-huh <laughs> I'm just gonna keep laughing at you every time you have a technical error. My, might as well. Yes. That's what you happens when you use a mixer instead of an interface. Yes. Hooray <laughs> for shit equipment. I know. Well, if, 
people would buy t-shirts and help us out feed the behind the barricade family maybe we yeah. have better equipment oh god imagine if we were homeless and we just had to rely on our fans we'd, we'd have five dollars <laughs> nick jones thank you for your contributions yes i i would say it's going to uh alcohol and drugs but we don't make that much <laughs> no definitely not <laughs> we don't live that rock star life no and, and you know what I, i'll be real honest with you it's not gonna happen with this definitely not straight up this is like extreme secondary not primary or yeah supposed that, to be, that, at least that, that's the problem that i keep stressing to people it's like all right if you're gonna have a podcast this can't be your primary thing like everything you do can't revolve around the podcast because it'll never work Unless like you're fucking Joe Rogan, <laughs> not even Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan does around his stand up. Well, no, he could. He, could, I'm saying, like he could transition to it. Yeah. You know, obviously, if you wanted to, he's probably living a specific type, a type of lifestyle. But if you wanted to live in my apartment and podcast, he would totally be able to do that and nothing else. Oh yeah. Plus, I, th I think there's rumors that he makes close to fifty thousand an episode. Dude, you want to know what's so funny? He talks. He talks about himself like he's not rich. Like, oh, yeah, like he talks yeah, he's about like, loaded. other people. I mean, I don't know. I guess like if you're, if, I mean, then again, he's probably not making millions of dollars. He's probably like someone who makes 500 grand a year. You know? No, I, I, th I think he's, he's, he's a millionaire. Yeah. I, I could see well, that. I, he's a millionaire, meaning like he has million, like a million dollars in a bank, in his bank or total, you know, but he probably doesn't make a million dollars a year. I'm gonna have to and disagree. I'm sorry if, 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 but if he does, I mean, I'm just kind of going off of his opinion. Yeah. Would, if he does, like, you're rich if you make a million dollars a year. I'm fucking sorry. Even if you make oh, $800,000, you're rich. Because they say if you make $60,000 or over, you're not in scarcity. So if you make uh, 100 times that, uh, yeah, you're rich. <laughs> actually, wow. 60 grand is the limit? Yeah, I think sixty grand. Sixty grand is your in scarcity. Like once you get over fifty nine thousand or something. Holy shit! Yeah, I mean wow. it's true. I mean I I make freaking not even half that, and I feel like if I made fifty grand, I'd be well off. Wait, you make less than thirty k, dude? Tell me Holy about it. How do you fucking live? I'm pretty sure I, I'm pretty sure I do, but it's just just barely thirty k. Holy shit! Yep. Like I'm, I'm about, uh, I'm about at 40, but, and I, I still can't even fucking live off of that. Yeah. But you also have student loans. Oh yeah. That, that basically but kicks honestly, my ass like, year. It's so funny too. This, uh, I was talking to this girl at work about my car being shitty in the snow and she's like, why don't you just get a new car? I don't want car payments. It's like, come on. I'm like, dude, I can't afford a car. And, and she like, couldn't believe it. I'm like, yeah. dude, <laughs> I really can't afford a $200 car payment every month. No, 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 no. If you wanted to, to if you wanted to be a two hundred dollar car payment, you have to put down like three, four thousand dollars. Well, dude, my Scion, I literally put down fifteen hundred dollars, and I had to pay three hundred fifty a month. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's for your fucking Scion. I mean, then again, I would have that much money trading in my Scion. Like it would probably be, I would say maybe twenty five hundred dollars. Yeah. But I'd still, I don't have any money to put down on it. No. I mean, I do, but I'm not gonna waste the only savings I have for fucking a car payment. Yeah, I, I don't know. It, it's it's rough out there. Mm -hmm. But then again, like uh, I don't know. I for me trying to do like music and stuff, I'd rather be that way and push forward than to just have to just like grind it out, go to college, you know, doing something I don't want to do. Oh, dude, hundred percent agree. I mean, dude, you I, you could make it by with thirty thousand dollars. I mean, sixty thousand just means like. You could most likely you could have a car, you could have an apartment, and still have you know you're not worried really. Yeah. Obviously, if you have a freaking Mercedes Benz, and you bought a house that you can't really pay, and you have kids, obviously you're gonna be, is <laughs> you're gonna be in scarcity. But that's probably like living normally. That's true, man. I I, I can't see myself having kids. Dude, I I mean I want kids, but if I make thirty thousand dollars and i can't support myself or the way i would want to be supported why would i have a kid exactly you're but, smart when it comes to that yeah like i don't i don't want a kid i mean yeah i'm a little bit selfish obviously but if i if if i was someone that could give to someone else so you know give to a child of course i'd have one but 
again, I don't want the child to grow up like me, not like I grew up bad. I think that like made me a stronger person. But I mean, if you're a good parent and you, you grow up the opposite way I did, meaning not having that much money and shit, like it's so much better that way. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. It's, I don't know, it's, it's weird. Mm-hmm. Like, both of us, obviously, we're not trust fund kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> if we were, we wouldn't be doing this fucking podcast right here. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I'm pretty sure I'm getting a, a, a decent amount of money from my, a grandpa- my grandparents' inheritance, but it's not something that I'm going to live off the rest of my life, not even close. It'd just be something I leave with my ret- for my retirement, you know? Huh. Here's a, here's an interesting. But still, that's kind of lucky, though. I mean, oh some yeah, people, absolutely. They have to pay their grandparents' uh, debt. Oof. I know. It's terrible. Yeah, that sucks. Here's an interesting question for you. Mm-hmm. Right now, if uh, you account for, let's say, your grandparents' money and whatever else, mm-hmm. what would your net worth be? Net worth. Yeah. Dude. So how much you make, how much you have in the bank, what your cars, your property adds up to. Yeah, but how would the net worth of how you how much how would like the amount you make, how would that even be able to factor in? Because like it you only get it a total like at the end of the year that's your total. Like does that count? Like oh, in one year you make 30k, so that's your yeah, net yeah, worth yeah, absolutely. plus everything else. Yeah. Dude, less than 100 grand. Okay. Actually, I don't know. I mean I would say maybe over that because I, I mean, I don't, I'm pretty like, I'm pretty sure my grandparents have close to a million dollars or over that. I would definitely Jesus say. Christ. Yeah. Dude, they're, they're mad smart, but it's still not a lot of money. If you think about it, like if you wanted to retire at 80, I mean, obviously they're 90, so they had, they had more than that in retirement. But if you're someone that said, oh, I have $500,000 when I retire, just think about it. If you're making thirty thousand dollars a year, ten years is three hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, I mean that's living the way I do, which is not easy. No, like if not you're at old all. and you have doctor bills and shit like that, and you're paying Medicare and Medicaid and stuff. So like yeah. five hundred thousand dollars is ten years. So if you had to live off a million dollars, that's twenty years of fifty of fifty grand a year. And praying you're dead after that. Exactly. Yeah, they say they say that. Um, like the biggest thing is not not having an, like outliving your savings, not ha- you know, not dying early. Yeah. I don't know. I'm trying to think about it, about this because if you do die, uh, and you have like an inheritance, apparently there's a death tax. Yeah, but supposedly Trump was getting rid of it or got rid of it. Uh, allegedly. Yeah, it's like half your money. So they take half your money when you're alive, and then when you die, they take half your money. So essentially, they get the full money. Well, if you think about it. I te- technically, no. Technically, it sounds like it, but technically, no. I know, but... Yeah. It's like they just have to keep dipping their hands into your pocket mm-hmm. when you're alive and dead. Yeah. I forget who it was on Rogan, but I totally agree. They're like, we know that they spend they spend our money not, like intelligently we should know and you know like they should tell us i mean obviously it's difficult but there should just be like a standard this is what we're using the total of your tax money for oh that was that was uh tom segura on the thousand thousandth episode yeah i agree yeah. Dude, totally yeah because it's like if you're taking half my money it better be worth it absolutely Man. how do you feel on like the whole st- the the whole food stamp thing what do you mean? Because it's, it's you, you know, like hardworking people like me and yourself or and our parents and stuff, they get mad at people that use food stamps. Like, you, you know, when you see people that like they're living large and they like don't make it and they have food stamps, not like living large, but no, spending, yeah, I understand. spending their money the way that they definitely shouldn't on food stamps and, and not wanting to give your money to people like that and food stamps. Like, how do you feel? Uh, honest, honestly, it doesn't bother me too much, but I kind of have to applaud them because they found the loophole in the system yeah. and are able to do all this shit off of food stamps and not working. I mean, if you could live off the government, I mean, technically the government lives off of every single person. Mm-hmm. So if a, so a single person can actually turn the tables and live off the government with assistance and everything else, pff, mm-hmm. good for them. Can't yeah, even I mean, be angry. Yeah, like you're like 
yeah, they're living off of a portion of your money, but I mean, they're also living off of, I would say, more of a portion of rich people's money, don't you? Wouldn't you think? Because, like, if a rich person is paying more in tax, well, I mean, technically they're not. With, like, say it's not a smart rich person that has an accountant. You know, if you pay over your lifetime $500 million in taxes, but I only pay a million dollars. Clearly, you're, they're using more of the freaking rich people's money. And that I don't agree with. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're, if you're, all right, look, if you came from basically nothing and became rich, I think you should keep most of that money. Mm-hmm. But if it was like an inheritance, then I think you should pay. Yeah. But you know how pissed people would be? No, people are pissed regardless, so who gives yeah. a fuck? <laughs> I mean, not for nothing, though. Like, And there also should be a limit. Like, you, There should be a limit to how much money you can make. Uh, Dude, what that, if, you, if you make $500 million? Like, are you serious? Sometimes it's just like $500 million. Then again, investments, I mean, the, uh, that's what I'm saying. I'm always like devil's advocate that I can't even side with my own self. <laughs> Because it's like, yeah, what if this person has like investments and they're technically making income off of a hundred a hundred million dollars they earned, and they end up making five hundred million dollars? And dude, it's totally worth it. But I don't know. I and also I feel like there should be once you reach reach a threshold, you should be paying more in taxes. I agree with that. Mm-hmm. I I, th- I think someone who makes a million a year shouldn't be paying the same amount that we pay. Yeah. Like they they should be in another bracket. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, t- take a uh, take my girlfriend for example. Like she she makes a she she does well for herself, but she's in another tax bracket and she's getting whacked. So by the time everything is all said and done, you know she probably makes as much as I do, which is pretty sad because I I see the first figure and then I see the bottom line after everything is taken out. I'm like, oh my god. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That, yeah. that completely sucks. <laughs> well, dude, it was so funny because obviously I know this guy has t- investments that are, you know, tax deferred and all that shit. And they have ta- uh, accountants that are get finding loopholes and shit. But Tony Robbins was talking about, I don't know, it, definitely not now because he definitely makes a shitload more. But he was talking about making $500,000 a year and they literally take half. Oh, like, my God. Uh, half of your money? Like, what are you doing with... 250 grand a year like and why why should you take half of that it just does, it dude it, it does not make sense yeah Especially they since don't we have trillions of dollars in debt like what the hell are you doing with these rich people's money let alone the poor people's money exactly how are we still in debt after all of this mm-hmm. yeah. i mean I think mean, about it there, there's got to be at least okay how many people are in the united states was it 360 million dude i have no clue <laughs> Uh, I, all right, let's let's just round it off. Let's go 500 million. I'd say at least 150 to 200 million people make at least what 100 grand. Mm-hmm. All right, if you're taking 50,000 out of that, so 50,000 times what? I, let's go 50,000 times 200 million. Mm-hmm. Let's see if that even pops up on my calculator. There's 50,000 like times two zero 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 one two. Okay. And that equals, okay, thousand million billion. That's 10 trillion. Mm-hmm. Where's this money going? Yeah. I mean, obviously, it needs to go to roads, government, like clean it, like cleanups and shit. Yeah. I, I I completely understand all that, but how are we still a trillion or two trillion in debt? That means you have to be spending twelve trillion if your return is at least ten trillion. Dude, I, well I know they spend a shitload of money on the military. Yeah, no, that's true. But honestly, I'd rather overspend than underspend. Mm-hmm. Well, dude, when like, it comes it, to defense. Well, when it, yeah, well, definitely about that. But when like. Actually, mostly, I, I think it's mostly offensive, to tell you the truth, but that's just my opinion. Well, um, yeah, I mean, you, you, you got to have a good sports team all around. 
But I mean, you you got you got to have a good offensive line. You got to protect your offense, mm -hmm. and then you have to have a good defense with a great defensive line. Mm -hmm. I mean, listen, we we all know that we're still in debt because of politicians spending money in stupid areas, but I don't know. I don't think that that issue is going to be solved anytime soon. Nah. Yeah, I mean, no, no offense to uh, our president now, love him or hate him. It's basically 50, 50, but you know, I, I think he got over his head in a lot of things, including, you know, spending and shit like that. I mean, he's, well, all right, like I've like I've said numerous times, we needed someone like Trump, but we don't need Trump. Mm -hmm. If we had like a if we had like someone like Elon Musk, who was thinking of like all these incredible ways to help the you know environment, help the world, help like the roads, the the cars and stuff like that, and can make all that shit somewhat affordable, I think he'd be a great he'd be a great asset. Dude, you want to know what's so funny that I. I can't wrap my head around when I hear people like, obviously I watch some of his stuff, but when I hear people like Alex Jones say Elon Musk is part of like the elite and shit, would the, like, it's part of the Illuminati. But what I, <laughs> what I don't understand is like, if he really was a part of the elite, why would he want to make electric cars over gas? Like, wouldn't the elite, elite people be for gasoline cars always? Like, wouldn't uh, they... unless he has some kind of weird stock in electric, uh, I don't know. Yeah, unless like it's gra like Exxon is gradually going to re revert to electric. Electric, you know. I mean, they really should. Mm -hmm. You talk but... about like solar, you know, solar energy and those roof tiles and having the solar cars, like the charging stations all over. Like, it's literally free <laughs> to charge your car. So why would you need Exxon? So you feel Very like true. the elite would not want that to happen especially if you could just be able to drive like 150 miles out and back and then just charge your car for free and not have to go to a gas station or even a charging station that costs money yeah hmm. but dude it's going to be a great way to bring your your business to other places like we have a charging station come fill up <laughs> absolutely like a quick come check yeah, come fill up. It'll take, what, five, ten minutes. Come in for a cup of coffee. Come in for uh, a meal. You'll be good to go. I don't know. Who knows? That's why I don't, that's why I don't watch the news. No, it's like I have too much shit to worry about. Exactly. I mean, look, you put on one channel, we're going to war with Korea. You put on another channel, yeah, Donald Trump said this. He's a ist, 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 ist. And put on another channel, it's basically a blend of the two together. It's just it's just unneeded aggravation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean that's what Adam Sandler movies are for. That's where you get your aggravation <laughs> out. If you make if you make less than fifty thousand dollars a year, don't watch the news. You have more to worry about. Oh fuck yeah. <laughs> you kidding me? I mean, I guess it's like kind of good, but at the same time, like two things of recent that I wasn't aware of until kind of it was big news the eclipse i literally didn't know about until the day of and swine flu i didn't even know that was like a thing because uh, i don't, I don't uh, watch okay news. i don't watch cable tv nothing all right we're, we're gonna have to uh dissect these two you've heard nothing about the solar eclipse until the day of jesus christ that's all i've been seeing online is oh we're the best places to watch the solar eclipse and that's How to make so it funny because i'm yeah. on facebook like constantly but again, I really think it's because there's like the shit that's shoved in my face on Facebook is not was is not that. <laughs> oh yeah. You know, it's mostly I see is like Trump shit, good or bad, or like music Dude. shit, obviously, because I have a lot of those pages on mine. But and then like people, you want to know the funniest thing is when people are like, "What do you live under a rock?" It's like, no, I don't come home and watch the news. I have projects that I work on. I do I do things. Like, I'm actually yeah. constructive with my time. Jesus. And also, the swine flu? Yeah, dude. That was pretty bad. This was, like, m like months after. <laughs> it was, like, a th <laughs> it, it was pretty bad. Now, not, not to alarm you, but uh, apparently mad cow disease was a big thing. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was the same thing, too. I, I might blow your mind here, but uh, bird flu was something. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, you know what's okay. actually funny, too? I just watched that movie, What the Health. 
and they were talking one of the guys was talking about that certain like symptoms like they said that mad cow disease is made i don't know if he said it has or like proof was proof he was like what he was the whistleblower for the mad like the mad cow disease yeah he said that it, it he thinks it's still prevalent and a lot of people a lot of people uh, like their symptoms are misdiagnosed and it's actually mad cow disease in humans so humans are eating humans no 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 meaning like they have the like the adaptation of mad cow from because it's only a disease that cows get right uh, i'm assuming yeah exactly so like we got like a, a form of it okay yeah and like it, well, it was because we were eating cows that had mad cow disease or we still are apparently oh, but i love a good steak kid i know oh, oh i'd love a good steak yeah, you want to know what's funny? <laughs> You're going to laugh at this, too. I re you, Do you realize? Well, I mean, I ate steak as a kid, but I never went to a place and had a steak until four years ago. Wait a second. You've never went to a restaurant like a re and ordered a steak? Nope. Fuck. And I, didn't, I never knew what a good steak was until about four years ago. Because, I mean, like, when my parents made it, it wasn't really... I mean, it didn't have, like, butter. It didn't have, like... It had, like, steak seasoning. But it was kind of dry, and I'm just like, I really don't like steak. But, dude, I went to Ar Arthur's and Morris Plains, and it changed. <laughs> Everything changed. And now I'm wow. trying not to eat meat. <laughs> yeah, you're really going in the opposite direction yeah, here. Go figure. Yeah, I don't think I agree with you on that one, but... <laughs> hey, whatever we'll what happens. Hey, if it works out for you, good for you. Exactly. More steak for me. You want to know what's a funny thing I hear? No offense to people, but they're like... Oh, I'm going to I'm going to try eating vegan to see how good I feel and then I'm going to go back to eating meat cuz I love eating meat. Well, clearly No. <laughs> but clearly you're eating vegan for a reason. So, why would you go back to eating meat cuz you love it? Like, Dude, it's clearly... it's the same <laughs> Yeah, man, it's the same as saying I'm going to go on a diet for 30 days, but on the 31st day, it's pizza and ice cream. <laughs> it's like, yeah. "No, you're supposed to you're supposed to watch what you put in your body." But you want to know what the problem is, though? I mean, yeah, I, lo I think maybe eating a little bit of meat is good for you. Someone like me, it's like alcohol. So, yeah, like I could have meat, meat after being vegan every once in a while or after a few years. But I feel like that would make me sp spir uh, spiral into like a into relapse or whatever you would call. <laughs> <laughs> relapse. Meat relapse, huh? No, but seriously, like I, I'm kind of I would say I'm kind of addicted to food. Like not bad, obviously. I'm not like okay. my 500 pound life or whatever, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. I can control it. But yeah, S speaking of meat and alcohol, dude, you you haven't lived unless you had a nice flamingon or a porterhouse matched up with a nice red wine, dude. There is nothing better. Have you ever nothing been to more Longhorn, American Longhorn Steakhouse before? Of course, dude. Did you like it? Yes, but I found a chain that's even better than Longhorn. Dude, when I went, it sucked. And I literally went like two weeks ago. Dude, Texas Roadhouse is the place to go. Dude, that place looks badass. It it, it really is. Where is there one around here? Uh, there's one Teterboro Airport. Oh, really? Yeah, because the only one I went to, well, I didn't go to it. The only one I I know it was near a hotel I was staying at for a friend's wedding in Pennsylvania. Uh, Redding. There was one in Redding, but... um. Yeah, dude, I don't know. Like the Longhorn Steakhouse, honestly, Outback was t was ten times better. I don't oh, know. Oh, dude, it was. I hate Outback, man. I don't know what. Yeah, but I don't know what it was. We, me and me and Sarah, probably the like, seasoning. Yeah, but we got like a two person, like a two person steak. It was like the porterhouse, isn't that? That's like filet mignon on one side and t bone the, on the other or whatever. Yeah, the porterhouse for two. Dude, dude, I eat one of those by myself. Dude, you want to know what the funny thing? It was it, like I mean, yeah, I ordered it like medium well, but Ugh. I'm sorry, I've ordered steaks at so many places medium well this like sucked there was no seasoning on it wasn't juicy it was just like like oh yeah if it was dry but it had flavor to it that would be one thing but it literally was it was dry and had no flavor whatsoever dude i gotta bring you to this one uh steakhouse it's called the roots it's in uh ridgewood mm -hmm. dude classy place yeah you're that gonna place is all, ridgewood's good <laughs> yeah, dude, yeah classy place you're gonna pay a lot but it's gonna be the best steak of your life mm-hmm Dude, well, one you, one of the I think it's number three on my list. Of you've top never, have you ever had Arthur's and Morris Plains? Oh, Arthur's. 
I don't think so. Dude, it's really good and it's only like twenty like twenty four dollars. Okay. It was like fifty dollars at, at Longhorn and it sucked. Like at least twenty four for like a very freaking good steak is a good price. Oh yeah, the the porterhouse or two I think is like forty four. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And the, yeah. it was shit. It was pure shit. Well, you got a medium well, man. There's only one way to have a steak, and that's medium rare. Yeah, but again, like, when you get a steak and it's burnt medium well, you didn't cook it the right way. Mm. <laughs> Even well done's not burnt. But well then again, it just you... means there's no pink. It doesn't mean it's burnt. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the problem. You got a steak from a. A, a chain steakhouse. Yeah, it's like it's like getting a burger from Burger King and then getting one from an actual steakhouse. And I'm not gonna lie, I would have enjoyed a Burger King burger way better than that steak. Probably, dude. But I mean, a- again, that's that's the issue with how I like my steak is if I got it medium medium well, it's burnt. But then if I get it well done, well not well done. If I get it, what is what's the other one? Medium Medi- rare. Medium rare. It'd be too rare. But I love a good rare steak, man. Oh, no, I the bloodier the better. Like, dude, I could cook a steak better than that, and I'm not a chef. It's like, how could you not cook a steak and not burn it? Because it's some guy making nine bucks an hour, hating yeah, his life, and cooking true. some food. That's true. I got you on that one. Yeah. All right, here, here, look. My top three steaks of all time. Two of them we can visit around here. One of them is out in Vegas. That's my number one is out in Vegas. I think it was Anthony's Steakhouse. It's in uh, the M Resort. Dude, when I'm telling you melt in your mouth, I'm telling you melt in your goddamn mouth. It is beautiful. Like, I almost cried having that steak. And you want to know it's funny? Like, when I eat fat, it's, like, disgusting. But, dude, there's sometimes when you eat a steak and you just eat the fat, it tastes so good. It's, dude, it's, it's just, like, odd. Th- dude, this fat was incredible. Like, I had a... Uh, I had a fillet the first night. I had a strip the next night, and I had the porter nice porterhouse the night after. I had steak for three straight meals. I didn't <laughs> give a fuck. You want to know what's so funny? D- dry age steak is supposed to be like more expensive and better, right? Yeah. <laughs> People don't realize that dry age means like it was moldy and they moldy, the yeah. mold off of it. Yeah, absolutely. But, th- but then again, fermented foods is uh, bacteria, so. Yeah, but the thing with the the dry age compared to like the wet age is dry age they still cook it, like it's still no, on a still low cooked, low but like, heat. But yeah, that thing had mold on it, like you had yeah. raw meat sitting out. <laughs> it just I don't know. For me, when I think about it, that does not sound like it's supposed to be healthy for you. Who gives a fuck? It tastes great. <laughs> I might die, but I'm dying well. <laughs> You're goddamn right. So that was my number one joint. Number two is a uh, place in the city. Shit. I can't remember the fucking name of this. Uh, actually, I can look that up real quick. Hold on. Steakhouse in NYC. And it wasn't like... Wolfgang Puck or some shit? No. It, w- it wasn't like the big names. Like, uh, like Wolfgang Puck or... Um, the hell's that one in Brooklyn? Hmm. The I, one that everyone loves. Uh, I have no clue. The one where it's like a hundred dollars. <laughs> Eat cash only. But dude, I, I can't see myself fucking paying that much for goddamn food. Oh, dude, it's for ridiculous. You know, it's one meal. So for twenty minutes, you it was amazing, and then there you go, boom. There's a hundred dollars. Yeah. <laughs> All right. It wasn't El Frisco. Uh, it wasn't Keens. But anyways, I went there on uh, Christmas last year. Mm -hmm. Dude, phenomenal. Is there one of those places where you're like, you got this plate full of steak? Oh, yeah. No, no, no. You want to know how awesome this place was? This place actually brought you the steak and cut it up for you. Like hibachi style? (laughs) No, no, no. As in, like, they had a uh, whole steak, and then they're like, okay, cut, cut, cut cut put on your plate they took some sides like put it on it like your mom was feeding you (laughs) oh you want more macaroni (laughs) dude i got a i was with my friend james we went to the uh, knicks celtics game it was at 12 on christmas right afterwards we're like all right we gotta look for a steakhouse we found the steakhouse i was like uh yeah um do you have any reservations they're like well if you come by 4 30 i was like okay what about three o'clock good enough come on down sweet (laughs) so went down I got a, I got a, uh, I got a porterhouse. James got, I want to say, a strip steak. We shared uh, some uh, green beans, some mac and cheese, 
mashed potatoes, something else. I forgot what the hell it was. Uh, and they came over, they put a little bit on your plate and stuff like that. It, dude, the service was out of control. I think we, I think we dropped, I think, 200 for it. Oh, my God. But it was fucking worth it, dude. I, I don't know. I'm, like, just really, like, thinking in terms of investment, and I'm like, that sounds like a terrible investment. Oh, it absolutely is, but it's yeah. fucking worth it. Dude, it's Christmas. I get it. It's yeah, Christmas like it's, and you're in New York. Wise, you know, obviously... Oh, yeah. When you spend freaking forty-five dollars or a shitload of money to do something like skydiving, where it's only a few seconds, but it's more than just like time—the time that you spend, it's the experience and whatever, you know. Yeah. Like you'll obviously you remember how good that steak tasted when you when you ate it. Oh my god, I I, I still I still compare every single steak I ate to one of those steaks. You, well, I want to ask you though, if you went a year. How, how would you feel if you did something that when you went back and you ate that steak, it didn't taste as good? Like when you ate it, you're like, I, I could take it or leave it. Wait, what do you mean? What I'm saying is, what, say something happened in your life that when you went, if you went back to that place, like next year, and you ate that okay. steak and, you, and, you, and you'd say, I could take it or leave it. What would you think about that? You could take or leave the steak? You, you know, like, you, when you eat something and you're like, it didn't really hit any spot. You're like, I could go without eating that for forever. Like, it really didn't make me love it or hate it. Oh, like a very indifferent about the steak? Exactly, yeah. It, it has happened to me before, like, with other places. Like, I'd, I'd be raving, like, oh, my God, this was the best whatever I, I have ever eaten. And I bring someone else there, I'm like... This is pretty mediocre. I'm not going to lie. What the fuck? <laughs> well, the reason I brought that up is because when I went, like, healthy for a few years, that's how, like, the food that always tastes amazing tasted for me. Like, I'd go to, like, Applebee's. Like, now if I went to Applebee's and ate, like, a cheeseburger, I'd be like, oh, that was freaking good. I'm just using Applebee's as an example. Yeah. But when I was, like, eating really healthy, I went there, and I'm like, I don't know how I ever ate this stuff. Like, not that it was disgusting. It just wasn't. Like, it didn't heat the spot. Like, if I went to Wendy's now, I'd be like, oh, that was amazing, but it's so bad for me. If yeah. I, if I, when I went there healthy, I was like, I don't even know why I just did that. <laughs> it was so oh. weird how much my, like, taste buds changed. No, I hear you. By what the way, it, it was... I'm sorry? Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was about to say, it's uh, Benjamin Prime Steakhouse hmm. in I don't New York City. It. 23 East 40th Street, New York, New York. Open today from 11.30 a.m. to 11 p.m. For reservations, you could call 212-338-0818. Shout out. I want a free steak. <laughs> to hell yeah. <laughs> Behind the barricade. Sear that shit into the name, into the steak. Uh, yeah, I'm, tr I'm trying to pull up a menu or like uh, a menu with like prices. You, you, you keep talking. I can talk too, but. But. But yeah, go Google the place, Benjamin Steakhouse Prime. I'm trying to think. My brother like has been to a place that it's like, oh, you, like as a table, you spend like 200 bucks, but it's you get like a a crap load of steak. Is it like a Rodigio type of place? I have no clue. You know what Rodigio is? No. Explain. It's a <laughs> it's like a like a Brazilian buffet. But with all meats, like they'll come around with like skewers and they will cut the meat off of the skewer right in front of you and put it on your plate. Mm -hmm. And you control how much meat you want and what you want. Mm -hmm. So like they keep, they keep bringing around like random chicken, like lemon chicken or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I think I had chicken liver before it wasn't that bad. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but they come out, come around with like the flaming yawn ever so often. And it's usually like wrapped in like bacon and shit. Mm -hmm. And they take a huge ass skewer. And they start, like, take a huge-ass steak knife and just start slicing off pieces of meat. And you have a paddle there, which is, like, green and red. Mm. And green means you want the waiters to come over and give you the meat. R red, you don't want any more meat. Mm. Wow, that's funny. It, it's it's big in Nork. Mm. You want know, the funny thing is, though? Like, for that money that you spend on Christmas, you don't think you can go to, like, BJ's or a butcher and make a freaking great steak for a lot cheaper. Oh, I know I know for a fact I can. Yeah. But, like, dude, that's just my philosophy with, like, everything. It's like, yeah, I could buy this, but I could make it for maybe the same price or a little bit more expensive but better in terms of options and shit. 
Like, I don't know. Yeah. I'm just totally into, like, doing things yourself. No, I, I understand that. But, you know, if I, it's not like I do this, like, every week. Oh, it's exactly. Like a, yeah. Like, I'm talking Christmas Day. I, I'm with a good friend of mine. We just saw the Knicks probably get demolished. I think they lost. They probably did lose. Yeah, that's them every year. <laughs> Dude, we had great tickets for that. Like, we've been looking forward to that for a good two months now. And we're going to do the same thing this year when the Knicks play uh, the uh, 76ers. Hmm. And, and then we're like, you know what? Let's get a nice steak afterwards. We find the steak steak joint. Both got uh, glasses of wine. You know, it, it was... Look, I've had many Christmas dinners with, like, random people before. And they were good. But I thoroughly enjoyed myself when it was just me and James sitting there eating the probably the most expensive steak of my life mm. but it was goddamn worth it mm -hmm. yeah I, I actually would like to know how it would taste to to like kill a deer and then just like make it and eat it you never had venison before no i have but i'm just saying like yourself oh uh, because like, like like they say it's a, there's nothing like when you kill it and you eat it yourself obviously you have to do it right because you could <laughs> freaking screw it up but like if you did do it right Oh yeah, huh? Mm -hmm. So, no any idea. music uh, music news that we have? None whatsoever, <laughs> <laughs> except for three eleven playing Wellmont, our home our home ish area. Yeah, so th th that's pretty cool. They're going out on a whole October tour. I think they're playing uh, the Paramount in uh, Long Island on Halloween. Hmm. So that's pretty cool. I uh, have that uh, brand new brand new just uh, released their uh, latest album out of nowhere. It Man. took eight years to come out with it. <laughs> like Avenged Sevenfold out of nowhere. Just, oh, by the way, we have a new album. Yeah, more or less. It's out tomorrow. What do you, it's out tomorrow? What? <laughs> but the thing is, like, Brand New has such a weird, weird fan base mm -hmm. where they would support the bands even if, you know, all of them farted into a microphone and just said, this is our new album. <laughs> like, it's half people, like, like cultish people type of deal that are, I don't want to say pathetic, but, look, if it takes your favorite band to come out with an album within eight years, you'd give up and move on. But apparently with brand new fans, they don't care. Mm. Like, they'll do, they'll pay for whatever. Like, they, I think, uh, yeah, I think they did a $45 vinyl that they'd put out of the latest album. And it sold out before the album was even released. Yeah, but sometimes without... it takes, like, that time period for people to, like, love your album more. Like, oh, you haven't had an uh, album in eight years? Like, when, like I feel like when, when bands make a comeback, people, like, flock to them more. No, but I, th I think it's more of, like, a hip thing to like brand new. Like, the same way yeah. to like Radiohead. Oh, that's true. I, I think Radiohead sucks. <laughs> I've <laughs> never gotten into Radiohead. Dude, I, I only know Creep. Yeah, Creep and Karma Police. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously I know that one. Karma Police. It's like, oh, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And then their new shit, like, I try to listen to it. I'm like, what am I listening to? <laughs> and everyone, every, all the critics are like, this is the greatest piece of musical artwork that we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh. Well, at the same time, like, like you just you just said it's art. So certain people, like, you know, like when you see paintings, you're like, that looks like shit. But people are like, this is fucking amazing art. You're like, I can't see it. <laughs> but the problem, the problem with that is if people were genuinely into it. Like, I would understand if, like, you're a huge fan and you genuinely like the music compared to the people that are like, yeah, I, I like Radiohead. Like, I, I, I love them ever since, you know, I don't even consider Creep to be one of their songs. Like, I think they really started out with OK Computer. Like, trying to be too cool for the room, like, trying to get that hipster cred. That's the one thing I hate. And that's what bands like Radiohead, uh, Brand New, they... they I think most of their fan base are mostly com uh, consisted of these too cool for the room people. I only know that one song, like their most popular song from back in the day, brand new. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Even that song, I'm just like I could take it or leave it. I mean, it's they're okay. I mean, there's a lot of uh, songs I like by Brand New, but I don't know. It's just a weird aura around it. And their live show is probably the worst I've ever seen. <laughs> Weren't they included in a, in Madden on a soundtrack? Brand new? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Because I think that's the only song I know. I think the quiet things that no one ever knows. Mm. Yeah, but I'm looking it up. 
Yeah. Anyways, they came out with a uh, new album, first one in eight years since their 2009 release, Daisy. Uh, don't ask me what it was called. I completely forgot what the fuck it was called. Hmm. Uh, science fiction. That's what it was called. Wow. Madden soundtracks are actually still a thing. Yeah. Oh, there used to be so much freaking better. Oh, my God. Like, wh how terrible is it that it used to be freaking rock and, like, metal, and now it's just pop bands that you don't know? Except for Kendrick Lamar, obviously, you know who that is, but Snoop Dogg. <laughs> Literally, it's double O P T O W G. Every every one of these, I'm like, I don't know who the hell this is. Yeah, they actually have Action Bronson this year, which is pretty cool for him. Like, is it just too expensive to keep those rock metal bands? Like, or do you feel like yeah. they're pushing what they want to push? I think they're pushing what's popular. Mm. Yeah, but you don't think freaking like Disturbed is popular? Or what's more popular with the certain artists, like, uh, or with the certain fan base? Uh huh. Uh huh. What I don't understand is, you want to. So this is the funniest thing that I that I I can't understand, especially like when I play Madden and I play sports games like hockey or anything. When I watch football, they play Disturbed, they play Pop Evil, they play yeah. like the popular rock and metal songs. When you play these video games, they play pop shit. It's like when you're playing a sports game, how does this laid back, goofy pop song make you amp to play soccer? Like, how does that fit soccer? You know, like a football, like a fucking dudes crashing into each other, like head on head, like a freaking iron, like a gladiator contest. How do you fit like pop music with that? I, I, I just don't, I don't get it. I don't get it either. It's like, I mean, it's like metal. Like when you listen to metal, you get motivated. You want to like freaking work out or tear someone's heads off, head off. That should fit with football. <laughs> it just, it's weird. Yeah. Uh, and, and look, if you're going to go like market by market, obviously NBA should be mostly hip hop. Exactly. Yeah. Like NHL should be, I guess, a, I guess NHL should be the FIFA soundtrack. I, I think the I think it's more, it's more of an alternative fan base playing it. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, dude, I don't mind like in the menus, or something like that. But in certain in certain parts, like you should have rock and metal. Like there should be at least a few tracks. Yeah, I I, I, I can agree with that. Mm -hmm. It just and that's not like I'm trying to push rock and metal. It's just like, you know what you get out of that kind of music, and it should be included in sports more. And it used to. Like every Madden up until a, a few, like five years ago, maybe they had the the popular like that one song. Um, what's that song by uh, Five Finger Death Punch? Uh, the back, bleeding. Back for more. Oh, uh, <laughs> that wasn't a freaking Madden. And Five Finger Death Punch is a newer band, and just it's not. It you never hear that stuff anymore. Yeah, man. I remember when I used to listen to video game soundtracks, and it would shape the music I'd listen to. Exactly. I got a like lot of... Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2, man. Mm -hmm. That was the soundtrack for a lot of people. Dude. You had Bad Religion. You had, I think, uh, Pennywise. You had um, Rage Against Superman the Machine. song? Dude, that was like the most popular song. Superman? Yeah, it's called Superman. On Tony Hawk? Yeah, like the first one. Oh, I I, I don't remember anything about the first one. Superman it's about number layers. two. Dude, the first... Um, Goldfinger, Superman. Oh, yeah, Goldfinger. <laughs> Dude, that song was awesome. They need to remake that game. I think they did, and it like, flopped. Really? Oh. Yeah. Dude, again, those videotapes and shit. All right, yeah. Here, here's the soundtrack... Or the list of bands and artists for the uh, soundtrack of the first Tony Hawk Pro Skater. Dead Kennedys, The Ernies, Even Rude, Goldfinger, Primus, Speed Dealer, Suicidal Tendencies, The Suicide Machines, Unsane, and The Vandals. That was a very punkish soundtrack. Mm -hmm. So if you got into that, I mean, it came out, what, 99, I think? Mm -hmm. Well, dude, look, at Madden, Madden 2004 had edema. Had AFI, Alien Ant Form, Avenged Sevenfold, Blink-182, Bubba Sparks, Jet, Outcast, and uh, Thrice. 
yellow yeah. card. And then there was, a, there was like, and Soil, which is, was like their only freaking good song. Well, they had <laughs> another one, but like their only like radio popular, popular whatever. Yeah. But like, dude, this was per- like, yeah, this was more like rock heavy, but all the stuff in between, like this was perfect. Like you need that mix. Yeah. I don't know. And I guess like when you put out a soundtrack like that, that gets some people to buy it, which is retarded. It's like just yes. because of the music in the game, you're going to buy it. But That's true. Mm-hmm. I'm just talking about from like a presentation or like feeling while playing it. Like you need to use different songs. Yeah, I mean, if... If I'm playing Madden, I, w- I want to hear, like, in, like, I'm ready to kick off. I want to hear, like, Crazy Train by Ozzy or... Mm-hmm. They tried or, that, though, remember? Yeah. Like, a few years ago, they tried putting, like, ACDC and shit. And it was great. And people hated it. People hated yeah. that, though. But, like, no, like, yeah, being, like, one of the songs in the menus, no. But, like, when you go to kick off and you hear freaking Crazy Train, like, that's what needs to happen. But, like, dude, if they're playing rock and metal songs during freaking the, the, like, the highlights of a NFL, you know, watching on Channel 2 while you're watching an NFL game, yeah, like, they should have that in Madden, at least, like, in the freaking replays. Menus keep the rock and rap, you know? Yeah. Or you could just hire some local bands, local popular musicians to do your soundtrack for you. Yeah, you could do that. Or bring back the Madden music. Remember those? No, I don't. Where they had Madden-specific songs? Hmm. Oh, yeah, like they, like they composed them. Yeah. Dude, I, Dude, I don't mind that, that, that pumped too. me up. Yeah. Dude, you want to know what was awesome, too? Like when you... Uh, tr- you you've never played it, but Triple Play Baseball, they had like... Um, what was it? I think it's Twisted Sister. No, not Twisted Sister. Um, I Want to Rock. What's that What's that band? Twisted Sister. Oh, there you go. I was right. I Want to Rock. They had like rock. a they had a <laughs> remix <laughs> version <laughs> of that. <laughs> like some it was a band. But dude, it was it was like so much better than the original version. Huh. Just because it was like better produced, obviously. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um but dude, I like I love that. I love getting my songs from there. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I get like one or two songs that I wouldn't listen to normally from FIFA. Like a pop poppy rock song. Yeah. But or like a R and B song, but not really like rap. I don't know. I hear you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. All right, I think this is a good place to uh, end things. We've been talking for I don't know forty five minutes. Yep. No, fifty minutes. Wow. Oh, shit. Yeah, it's a little different. A little different of an episode. Kind of went more off the the cuff and out of the music topic, but yeah, I nice enjoyed it. Pace. Yes, that this was very lovely. All right, uh, let's see. Give me one second. All right, so 15 minutes. Yeah, we're going to include this. Okay, so we're going to end this right now with uh, Kevin's interview with the band Save Us from the Archon? Archon? Hmm. What, is A- what is A-R-C-H-O-N? I would say Archon. Archon? All right. Yeah. Save Us from the Archon. Uh, he did a uh, interview with the band. Uh, they are from southwestern Pennsylvania on Tragic Hero Records. Uh, check out their newest LP, Melancholia. I guess it's supposed to be Melancholy, but with an IA at the end. Mm-hmm. I don't fucking know. Available through Tragic Hero Records now. Um, yeah, they are an experimental post-hardcore slash progressive band. And you could like them on Facebook. Facebook.com slash S-U-F-T-A and then P-A. They're from Pennsylvania. So save us from the Archon P-A. Mm-hmm. All... Uh, is it an acronym? Hmm. Don't we have a band like that? Isn't there a band similar to that in the battle this week? Yeah. I want to say yes. Mm-hmm. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, yeah, yeah. All right. It's Shores of Archeron. No, <laughs> Acheron. No, no. Acheron. It, this one is A-C-H-E-R-O-N. You want to know what's funny when I look up those band names? And I'm like, this has to be the only one out there. And there's other pages, maybe not the oh, bands, yeah. that come up. Yeah. You know, like, how? How did other people come up with a name like this? I'm telling you, man, that one band name I came up with, no one else has it. Mm. And you just might know what that is in the future. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> bum, bum, <Hell> yeah. bum. <laughs> All right, Daniel. Always a pleasure. Let's, uh, let's kick this off to Kevin, Mr. Kevin Pereira. And uh, we'll see you next week. Yep.
Eh, what else are we doing with our lives? <sighs> Absolutely nothing. Exactly. So <laughs> we'll see you next week. Definitely. Alrighty. Peace. Later. Andrew, how are you? I'm fantastic. How are you feeling today, man? You know, I'm doing alright. Uh, my, uh, my cousin actually just got back from the States, and uh, poor girl's been jet-lagged so bad that at 1 o'clock, she, at, sorry, at 6 o'clock, I woke up to her texting me, telling her, telling me, I haven't, uh, I haven't actually been sleeping since, like, 1. She's been, she's been, you know, in wow. and out. Uh, coming in from the other side of the world just really just messes you up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but, so, you guys are releasing this new album, right? And it's called Melancholia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Melancholia, yeah. Melancholia. It's and, our fourth full-length studio album. Right. And I remember that you talked about it as your love letter to depression, not so much as a, um, not so much as it cripples you as it does give you a creative way to express yourself. Yeah, yeah, after you, um, after you deal with something for so long, um, which is actually what the word melancholia means as an extended period of depression is a very long um, it's a, it's a very long feeling that you live with, and, uh, all of my albums before are just personal reflections on, like, where I'm at, um, state of mind, lots of, lots of, uh, odes to, uh, regret and living with the choices you make, um, have been previous themes, and then it's just, you can only do that for so long before you just want to do something else, you just want to move past it, so that's what I've done with this one, I've used it all, mm -hmm. in a creative sense, to, um, just, you know, okay. put my feelings out there in sonic form. Okay, and let's talk about that single that you guys actually, the, the you know, the, the singles, the playthroughs that you guys have actually just recently put up as your teaser of, uh, you know, what's going on. There's Trancing Nostalgia and the yeah. actual video that accompanies it. Like, yeah, I, I set up in the woods with my camera and uh and just recorded me playing it through and uh i'm actually doing a bunch of playthroughs right now the next one's going to be even better i'm going to have a suit and i'm going to do a black and white thing okay that sounds fancy okay. yeah it's going to be another new one so we're just going to make a lot of um a lot of material for people to um grab onto and just um probably another music video in the works and we touring we leave next week, actually, for a national tour of the U.S. with uh, Adola and the right. Young Concept, so that should be a really fun time, and we're going to play new songs off the record. Okay. Uh, three, actually, which is, we've never really varied our set in the past few years, but this time we, um, we've had, like, eight songs in, like, under a half hour. Definitely, definitely. Uh, actually, funny note, Adola was actually an alum of BTB, and they were, one, they were the first band that I interviewed when I joined the podcast. Oh, nice. You talked to Andrew? Yeah, I talked to Andrew. We uh, actually talked about his upcoming album uh, that, you know, that's n used to be upcoming album. Now it's actually oh, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, no, yeah, this was a... Awesome, dude. I love, I'm very excited to, like, show the stage with those guys every night. I can't, I can't wait for it. Oh, dude. Like, I actually got to go and see uh, Save Us from the Archon uh, back in August 25th, 2016, when you guys played... You us? When you guys played The Strange Matter. You seen us? Yeah, I've seen you guys. I actually, uh, I actually Hi. met, I actually met you guys, uh, at the, uh, at the, uh, event. Like, uh, it was you at the merch table, you know, sort of idling yeah. around. Yeah, I always do the merch. That's right. And, uh, it, I actually got to speak to Devin right after you guys' set. And, oh, cool. and then following afterwards, my friend, uh, and I actually left the venue, uh, you know, a couple songs into Cyanvar's set. And we ran into Lionel, I think, um, your other guitarist, and the merch guy. Wait, what did, you, did you call him Lionel? Yeah, I, 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 I think <laughs> he's a his new name. His name's Nelson, but I'm gonna call him Lionel. Nelson. Oh man, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I like the other one better, actually. That's that's good. But where was that at? What state is that at? I I can't remember shows. We do a. We do a plethora of substances every night, so it's, it's hard for me to remember, really. I got you. It's, uh, Richmond, Virginia. Strange. Oh, Virginia. yeah! That was a good, yeah. Uh, Devin and, um, Devin and Will Swan from Dance Gavin Dance. That's uh, right. That the side project. They were smoking, uh, I think they were smoking a blunt or something. And Richmond's, like, a college town, so, like, the cops rolled up on them and shit. <laughs> I remember giving, 
taught a lesson in the back of our van, and uh, Sergio from Good Solas, he just like came out to me. I was like, uh, I think like your drummer's getting rested with Will, so just to let you know. And I was like, oh, cool. Like it, it didn't. Nothing happened. They didn't even get a ticket. That's fantastic. I think, I think they recognize Will from dance. They're probably dance fans. Yeah. Good job on that one. Yeah, I actually, like, uh, no, but, like, I actually ended up, uh, I, I, I just tried to make it a point to actually, uh, meet everybody from the co-headliners, you know, you guys in, in Sidebar, and that was honestly a, you know, head-exploding moment for me, you know what I'm saying? Oh, cool, yeah. Yeah, and, like I said before, afterwards, I left, and Nelson, uh, it's Nelson, not Lionel, I forgot, uh, and your, and your merch guy and Devin were all there just kind of chilling in the van, so we got to go and hang out with them, took a picture and stuff like that. It's, it's chill. Oh, cool, huh? Yeah. And I'm just kind of laughing about how, about a year to the date, we're actually sitting down and talking about this. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah. Down any time. Yeah. yeah. We don't like the new record coming, so we're very excited about that. And, um, yeah, just playing new songs will be fun for once. Right. So I actually want to know more about the new record, right? So, like... Listening to your past material, especially your live performance, it sounds like the band Polyphia, it sounds like Chun, it sounds like somebody took those two yeah. and chopped up time signatures and tempos and kind of threw it into a blender. Yeah, and, I like to think like Polyphia and Chun are kind of like the, the pop instrumental uh, metal, if that's a thing, and then we're like the indie, um, more like punk, I would say. I always refer to us as a punk band i don't think we're like a math band or anything i like the name punk better because it's all still just violent energetic style of music rather than like there's time changes and stuff but i've, I've gotten rid of like a lot of discord and stuff and just really focused on melody so it's like okay. the punk punk best i don't know yeah because it's like I, I, I don't know if I'd ever actually agree with punk because it's like, I mean, like, I hear punk and I immediately default to, you know, the Ramones or the Strokes or, you know... Yeah, maybe like a, maybe like a, oh, like an intelligent punk or something. I don't know, it's still, I still, I try to add a lot of violence when I write. I gotcha, um, I gotcha. Cool violence. Um, where, where's the other guys, like, Flippy and Sean will just, they'll, they're chiller, you know, they're, um... More like vibey music, like relaxed type, and the the style I usually try to write for is more of the opposite of that. It's more of like, um, how can I create as much chaos while still still being pretty um, yeah. musically, melodically. And that was but, one thing that I actually noticed about your guys' live performance, right? Like, uh, like my friend and I were actually my friend plays the bass and I play the drums, and we were both just kind of standing there in the middle of the, of the stage, just kind of the middle of the, you know, pit, watching you guys absolutely rip it up, and it, on one hand, it didn't sound like anything, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, we play faster live, um, because, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Dev, we'll get all, like, popped up on X or whatever, and then we'll just, um, dive into the set, we can actually play it twice as fast if we want, that's, that's a cool thing, that's crazy, <laughs> Like, if we want to get out of a show, like, one time we were, we were touring, like, Jerusalem Stalin, and, um, and he had this, uh, female singer at the time, and he hit her head with his guitar headstock, and she, like, started bleeding and collapsed, and we were about to play right after that, so we we're like, oh, the ambulance, and I, like, I ran up the promoter, I was like, hey, like, this, we should probably stop the show, man, like, we don't have to pay, just, like, give us our money, and, like, we'll go, we're good, and he was like, oh, no, you have to play. And we were like, fuck, and we just, like, really <laughs> didn't want to play. So Devin possesses the crazy ability to play all our songs it, uh, twice tempo. It cuts our set down to, like, 12 minutes or, like, seven songs. That's crazy. That's probably, like, there were, there were probably, like, 30, 40 kids there. So, and that was, they're never going to see that again because I can't remember how that happened. But, but yeah, we can, we, we like to vary the tempos, and we, um, we don't really play the same part every night. Like, um... Uh, of a few solo sections, I usually just improv on those, and Devil keep it pretty uh, freelance. He'll improv on the parts and everything. Yeah, no, definitely. Like, and that's and and that's actually one thing that, and that's another question that I actually had about your upcoming album is that you know a lot of the credit, a lot of both the praise and criticism about your new about what you've got to offer up on this uh, new album is. You know, they say it sounds exactly like Save Us from the Archon, which is to say that it sounds like 
this fresh noodling, this, you know, drum, you know, every other part is a drum solo. And, you know, it, it's very hard to keep track of what's going on. Pretty soon, it basically sounds like you're just kind of tracking yourselves having a drum, like, you know, just a, you know, jam session at hilariously fast tempos. Oh, yeah, live especially. But, yeah. um, yeah, it's always fun to try to write that stuff. Um, that's probably the hardest process in general. It'll take me, like, eight hours to write two minutes of one guitar track. Usually, so I work at a very slow, slow, arduous tempo. And that's why, um... We, I write in Guitar Pro 5, so it's a lot easier to dictate my thoughts and to write them down. I'll just cut, cut parts together from like other bars and bring themes back. But Guitar Pro makes it, it makes it easier because I can't remember a lot of what I play. When I go to write, I'll sit down with a guitar. True. And I'll write, and I, oh, I usually like smoke a lot of weed when I'm doing this, so I can't remember anything. So that's what Guitar Pro comes in, and I'll just noodle something out, and then you just, I'll just carry on from that point. Okay, I gotcha. You know, that ma that makes everything a lot easier, doesn't it? Oh yeah, I have all my thoughts to keep track of. It's very, it's very organized. Like, I'll throw a lot of ideas around, but it's, it's still very organized behind all the, um, behind the chaos. Sometimes I'll write things out, like 30 bars or something, and then go back and change those. Just to really give it a different feel. Yeah, give me one second. I'm having a small mechanical problem. There we go. Is that going to work? Yes, it is. All right. Sorry about that. My computer power supply is, you know, cutting in and out, so it's frustrating. But yeah. So all right. So then let's talk about your influences going into this. Of course, it's you know a lot of you know touches on what seems to be mental health and you know how is that going to play a part in any of the motifs that come in? You said there's also going to be a lot of melody, you know, things like that. What's, what can we expect? Uh, pretty much the, we made an album called Thereafter about three or four years ago or something. Mm -hmm. And um, Thereafter is my favorite album we've done. And it's, and it's basically along those lines. Uh, we, we use a lot of heavier static in between the tracks. Uh, where's the last one? We really didn't do that. And um, this one I really wanted to do Last like, album out just like minutes of just white noise and stuff like it's it's layers and layers of DL fours and stuff, but so still along the same lines, but um still the same chaos and everything, just uh, more structured. I have a couple melodic themes that uh, okay. weave back and forth throughout, okay. but those are like you'd have to listen to it very intensely to catch those. And I've also done something really weird, which is I took a one riff from each album that I've written. Okay. Including this like acoustic album I had when I was like thirteen, and I snuck them into each song as like a personal joke to myself. But yeah. um, if anybody catches those, I would just be that would be amazed. I kind of did it as a joke to myself. <laughs> sounds like so. Yeah, it sounds it sounds like a very niche joke though. Like uh, you know, an uh, oh, like yeah, I get it. Actually, nobody would know they were even in there if I wouldn't have just said that stuff. So. Right, it's just, it, but it's, yeah, because it's like, you guys are a very, and you guys are a very niche, you know, take on a very niche, you know, practicing of metal. Oh, right. yeah, it's a very small subgenre. One yeah. day I'm just going to pop, though, I'm going to, I'm just going to move to L.A. and I'm just going to play jazz tracks that you hear on elevators and stuff. Like, that's my sellout option. Like, I haven't hit that point yet, because we, like, we, we can, we make money now, so we can actually, like, tour and stuff, and. Okay. And, like, that won't last forever, though, so I'm going to sell out and start writing pop songs at a certain point, and uh, that's going to be the real thing. Okay, yeah. So let's talk about, let's, but let's talk about, uh, you know, how you, you know, made money, started started making money, because, again, you you said that you're a very small subgenre, and therefore it does kind of feel like you do have a very limited fan base to draw off of, right? Yeah. Yeah. And would you say that this album is going to, you know, make it easier to draw other people in, or is it going to be another, you know, one that's pretty inaccessible uh, unless you're already a fan of this kind of, you know, of this kind of music? Uh, I think it's a little bit more accessible. I think you're looking for, like, the term accessibility in music, um, which, is, which is always good for, like, record sales and stuff, but... 
I've, I've always written to just to try to make something that like I hadn't heard before. Okay. Which, which is something that rarely gets done these days. Everything kind of sounds like something else, or like you can you can listen to a band and be like, yeah, that sounds like a version of this. And I try to distance myself as much as I can from stereotypes like that, and just tr trying to make something completely unique. Mm. is in itself trying to make something that won't be recognized by other people. It's like, it's the exact opposite of pop music, for example. It's, it's trying to make something that someone's never heard. And with that, you you get a certain amount of, oh, well, I don't know if that's going to sell anything, or you just you don't know how anybody will respond to that. So it's more of like a artistic thing, right. um, which we've always tried to keep. But like, I write like catchy courses and stuff. What's that, uh, what's that noise going in the background? You hear a noise in the background? Yeah, like this, uh, scratching, like, dun, 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 like this, uh... Never mind, it's gone. Did you hear me? Is it gone? Yeah, it's gone. It's gone. Typing? Was it typing? Yeah, it sounded like typing. Did it? Ah, alright. So, how does, so, so, yeah, so how do the rest of the band contribute towards that vision of uniquity? Um, usually actually I'll, I'll write everything, me and Nelson will write like all the parts and we'll have them like I'll write Nelson the guitar part and go to the same for his songs um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll bring it to the band and then Devin will come in and he'll throw his uh, drums on top of it and then we'll work with those until we have the structure down and then um, yeah Brad does really whatever he wants on bass just Okay. Yeah, so it just starts from the core concepts of the two guitars. It's all strictly guitar driven music. Okay. But um having someone like Devin put his crazy touch on it really it makes it a little little weirder. Yeah, no, like I've been like I said before, ever like like after I uh after I saw you guys with uh Cyanvar, I uh went home and I ended up looking up, you know, like Devin's playthroughs and stuff like that, his his drum work. Oh yeah, his Instagram? Yeah, his, his Instagram, and it, it's just crazy, like... He covers Corn and, like, Paramore. And, uh, Selena Gomez, and, uh... <laughs> and then he'll jump into, like, you know, the damn Spring Frangentia. <laughs> it's, just, it's just fun to hear him go ham. I just... I'm very lucky to be able to, um... to play music with someone. He, like, he has his performance degree in drums. Yeah. And he, like, lessons on the side and stuff and we'll actually both teach lessons when we go on tour just to um you know so if you're in the state why might, might as well yeah uh you know like how much do you usually charge for lessons and, and uh what do you usually uh, cover and then we get like hang out in the back of my van and like i write a guitar for a lesson and stuff like that and just send them from there but yeah it's really fun on the tour just uh because usually the people who hit me up for lessons like no they just want to, like, learn the songs or, like, get guitar pros from that. But it's, it's always fun. All right, I got you. All right. So what do you think is the biggest obstacle, do you think, that you faced while writing this, you know, new album? Um, just, just not hating everything I would write or trying to still make new, fast map rock that's still, that's, like, slightly different that. Like I, we, I think we have a different sound, but if you try to do that over and over again, even if it's a different sound, it can get repetitive. So that's why we put a lot of interludes and a lot of backwards loop guitars, and we we step, like put more effort into the in between. It flows as like one piece, and that that took the most time to because once you have the the bass tracks, and then you just you can go in and build. We always build the album around keys, and so that they float in and out. Okay. Very, very smoothly. I like that. Like, I just like concept albums like that. Things that just flow from start to finish perfectly. So we, um, we, we actually tried to do that on every single record. I think it worked yeah. really well in this one. There's a lot of ambient space and stuff, which wasn't present in the last one because we had just gotten signed, and I wanted to make, I wanted to sell out a little bit, like just make something pretty catchy. And then this one, I just yeah, yeah, just kind of back to my back to my old ways. That's why I think it's like a thereafter part two musically. It's just everything's heightened a little bit. 
Okay, so like you know, like we can we can expect to see like you know the chugs like the chugging sections to be you know deeper and harder. We can expect the. You know, there's a little bit, yeah. There's a little bit more chugs on this one, kind of like the very first album we had. Yeah, and we can expect else in songs, but and we can yeah. also expect to you know see you know some grooving sections like the ones that Devin you know has previewed where he's in one part going absolutely ham and then ch and then you know dialing it back to this you know chill yeah we have, we have more clean parts in it too um, yeah never really dials back which is the cool part even you know, the clean parts um, and I have guitar solos in this one I did say that we've never we've never just specifically had guitar solos and said guitar solos mm. uh, which is more of like a you know Ingvay Mouse and Shredder type thing which is the kids love the shred so I I that might be a sellout move, but I, I specifically, when I was writing the song, said I'm going to put a solo in each one. Okay. I'm just make it that shit. And uh, it's, it, they're not long solos, but there is, in each of my songs, a, like a, a solo section, which we've never done. I even have a clean solo in one of them, okay. which is like uh, John Mayer on Coke. That's what I was going for. John Mayer on Coke. What does John Mayer on Coke sound like? It sounds like he's just crying a little bit more, except... Oh, he's, he's crying, but you can't hear it but you can hear it, you can feel it in the guitar. You're going to hear it, don't worry. Okay, all right. Don't drop it. You're going uh, to say, that was it. John, I feel the of Mayer. John Mayer on Coke. Man. Yep. Wow. It's like, it's like, it's like just, just imagine like the, uh, the guitar solo from Heartbreak Warfare, but like sped up and with, with like so many more key changes. Oh, yeah, but so clean and just... And it's real pretty. That's the that's the whole theme. I'm just I don't want to make like he heavy music anymore. I just want to make really really pretty fast. I mean, still fast. Yeah. And then yeah. a couple albums later, we might slow down and go all clean. Maybe I'll start singing, and then we'll shorten our name to Save Us. Okay. Yeah. That's, uh, that's the that's my my hidden future plan. Nobody else likes it, but well, I mean, no nobody else likes it, but they're all but they're still gonna hear you t talking about this. They might. There's a there's a chance they might. There's a chance they might if they decide to go and click on this episode, yeah? They might, yeah. Devin just lives in a house in the suburbs, he might not catch it. Yeah, no, no, like uh Yeah, no, what like following new name? What was the new name? I'm sorry? What was Nelson's new name? Lionel. Lionel. We're calling Lionel. him Lionel. Yeah. Lionel might catch it. Uh maybe Brown, I don't know. Yeah. That's <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Um but yeah, like uh, honestly, I'm I'm looking forward to this and, and understanding you know what your plans are for you know the future, uh, even if they might not necessarily be shared by the rest of the band. I mean, just to you know have that tossed out there means that you're thinking long term. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, and especially and I remember I was listening to uh, Circus Survive right, and oh, when they favorites. When they were coming out with Desensus, uh, Anthony Green had actually talked about the struggle of what it is to, you know, keep a band together. Mm. And that eventually, like all other relationships, it's going to end. But you are in control of, you know, how that relationship, what kind of state that relationship is when it, when it does collapse. You know, some cases you can have, like, you know, bitter band feuds, or you can have you know, amicable, hey, this isn't necessarily working out, let's just, let's start. Let's start a pop band, yeah. That's, oh. what, that's oh. what we're going to, but yeah, we're, uh, yeah, we're like a family, it's, uh, it, it will suck eventually, but we'll always, um, we'll always be doing something musically, whether, whether I make jazz elevator music in my 30s, or. All right, all right. It's something, music, something you always have with you, um, which is probably my favorite part of it, uh. That's why I'm trying to make the craziest things that I can now. Just so that later I can look back and say, well, yeah, I, I made some crazy music. Yeah. yeah. No, like, this is definitely, like, it's pretty, it, yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. That's, that's the only Thank way that, you. that's the only way I'm that trying, I have. trying really hard. So. No, no, it's, no, it's, and it's a very good kind of crazy, you know? Thank you. Like, uh. And like I said before, like like my friend and I, my friend and I saw you guys perform live, and you know, like I said before, we only stayed like for one or two songs of Signvar because we had to get back so we wouldn't get pulled up, we wouldn't get ticketed by the cops for illegally parking inside a Gold's gym. <laughs> um, yeah, and cops are dick. Yeah, cops are just in Richmond, everybody. 
Don't smoke weed in Richmond. In Do, the just don't. City. I mean, don't smoke weed in general, because I mean, like, I don't know, but I don't know. Like, I, I, I suppose that when your parents are feds, so they're just like, you just don't want to, you know, fuck up around them. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Ugh, it's ugh. Your parents feds? What? Your parents are feds? I have no idea what you're. No, 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 not no. at all. Uh, but I remember I was actually like, but more to the point of the story that I was trying to get at is that, uh, after seeing that you guys, you know, tear it up, I went home and I actually just kind of sat down behind the drum kit, like, you know, midnight and just started ripping it up, uh, much that's too, awesome. much that's, too, that's why we do, uh, that's why we tour and play the music we do so we can hope to inspire anybody who can, uh, get anything from it, really, that's, that's honestly the the most beautiful part to me. Yeah, no, it was, it was great. And then I and then I realized it was actually midnight. And my uh, and my people were actually trying to sleep. So. Oh no. Oh uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's all good. It's all good. Uh, it, 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 um, I'm still I'm still playing. I'm still you know having so much fun. And for every every time that I need a little bit more inspiration, I uh, actually end up pop on dearest forgetful I have. Hell yeah, man! That's awesome to hear. Thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because you guys were all about how you y'all need to, you know, spread Laclise by by word of mouth, and uh, that's the way that you guys get around, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, in closing, is there anything you want to go and plug to anybody who's listening? And there are people, and there are a lot of people listening. Like you know. Uh, everybody, we're gonna we're gonna be on tour. Um starting on the 17th with Adola and the ongoing concept. Uh, I'd love to have you come out to a show. And we're, we also have a new record that's coming out, 818. It's called Melancholia. Um, I, ho I hope you can listen to it and enjoy it. And that would make my world. All right, cool. Uh, and Andrew, again, thank you so much for uh, doing this interview with me. Uh, no for, problem. And thank you for having me. For anybody who's listening... Uh, follow me on Twitter at Grand Theft Academia. That is G-R-N-D-T-H-F-T-A-C-D-M-I-A. Please give our flagship account Behind the Barricade on Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, uh, any social media outlet. Find us, follow us, subscribe on Podbean, and we will see you back here uh, pretty soon. Andrew, thank you so much. Take it easy. No problem. Thank you. Bye. Bye.